All right, open your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 3. The book of Philippians chapter 3. I want you to pray for Sunday morning and our Sunday morning services. We'll have our Sunday school and then we'll have our morning worship service. I want to bring you a message Sunday morning entitled Blinded by Satan. Blinded by Satan. Remember, you and I have an enemy. An enemy that's far more powerful, far more intelligent than you and I could ever be on this side of heaven. And the Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Now you understand again that Satan can only be at one place at one time. He has a seat, the Bible says, where Satan's seat is or a place where he has his base of operation. And uh, yet these, uh, the demons that have gone after him are scattered uh, all over the world. And yet uh, Satan wants to destroy you and destroy your testimony and to destroy your life. And so he's always looking for someone that he may devour. But I'm so glad that we can say greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. Amen? And so we want to be praying one for another. Now, we're going through the book of Philippians. And of course, the book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. And a tremendous, a tremendous book, the book of Philippians, giving us tremendous instructions as far as we Christians are concerned. Now remember, the theme of Philippians is the Christ-like mind that brings Christian joy. The Christ-like mind that brings Christian joy. Now, I say that a lot because it's important. And let me give you the reason that I say that. The Bible says, as a man or a woman thinketh in his heart, so is he. The way I think, the way you think, that's who you are. That's who you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So the evil that comes from men's heart. And so let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The Christ-like mind that brings Christian joy. So if you want to have a life of joy and a life of peace, cultivate, with God's help, a Christ-like mind. Now the only way you'll find out how that works is through the Scripture. And so Paul is discussing here with us, all through this passage here, how we can have that Christ-like mind. Now, I want us to read verses 1 down through verse 13 of the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 1 through verse 13. And then we'll make some comments and we'll move right along. Beginning in verse 1, finally, or literally most important, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Now let me stop right there for a second. That is a warning to you and a warning to me that there are enemies of Christians. There are enemies out there. They are stuck on destroying God's people. They want to send as many people to hell as they can. And so Paul says, finally, most important, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. Now watch. To me, indeed, it is grievous, not grievous, but for you it is safe. I'm going to give you instructions that can bring you to a place of safety in your Christian life. Wouldn't it be great for us to be at a place of safety? And we want to stay at that place of safety. And in that place of safety, you'll have to stay in the Bible. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. You've heard that statement, haven't you? This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. I'm thinking about a young friend that I had. I grew up with him. We went through grammar school together, and high school together, and... 
um, never would ask the Lord to come into his heart and save him. He came to our church, sat through the services, revival services, evangelistic services, preaching services, and he heard the gospel, but he would never turn to the Lord. And then when he got out of high school, he went into areas where he should not have been. Uh, to make a long story short, I preached his funeral. As far as I know, that young man, my friend, from about age five, six, is in hell tonight. He did not have to go. And that in my mind, when I think about him, I wanted him to be in heaven. Now tomorrow, I was going to play a round of golf, and I was going to go with one of my friends. I was going to pick him up. We were going to drive to the course, and on the way to the course, or on the way back, I was going to say to him, now I want you to give me 15 minutes of your time. I don't want you to say anything. I want you to just listen, and then after that, I'll not agitate you, I'll not bother you, but I certainly will be praying for you that you will be born again. Now because of the rain, why well, we're not going to be playing, but I'm going to get him alone, and I'm going to try to give the gospel to him. You know why? Because I want him to be in heaven. I want him to be in heaven. And so we need to read here and consider what Paul has said very carefully because of verse 2. Look at it. Beware of dogs. The word dogs there means evil men. But they're using old cur dogs. By the way, in the Old Testament time and New Testament time, you really don't see a lot of statements about just little puppies and uh, you know that you keep in your house and so forth. Usually when you see the word dogs, he's talking about that which is evil and vile and wicked, uh, doing great damage. And so Paul is saying here, you better beware spiritually. He's not really speaking of, he's using them as an illustration. You need to be careful of these evil dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. That was a group that had bound together to try to stop Christians. You remember that the Apostle Paul was Saul. Saul of Tarsus. He hated Christianity. He hated anything that had to do with God. He was evil. And so he was on the road to Damascus with papers from the authorities to take Christians and beat them and to kill them and to punish them any way that he could. And on his way to Damascus, he was struck down by a light he couldn't see. And there was a voice from heaven that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to pick kick against the pricks or kick against the gourds. What he was saying, he was talking about an animal, an ox or uh, whatever that was plowing in the field and a new ox uh, had to be trained and they would put the harnesses on them and so forth and but they would still kick and they'd kick and they'd kick and they'd kick until they couldn't kick no more and finally they just gave up. And so God was saying to him, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. You're not going to win. And so he was taken to a place, and he used to meet a man there, and that man showed him the way of salvation. And this man, Saul, became Paul, the great apostle, that wrote these great books in the New Testament. There was a tremendous change in his life. When a man or a woman gets saved, there's a great change in their life. A great change. All things are... Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin a Hebrew of Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ what a difference listen to me now when a man or a woman 
regardless of how evil they are, when they come to the knowledge that they're a sinner and they can't save themselves and they realize where they're going to spend eternity and they realize that and they get on their knees and they say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I confess my sins to you. Come into my heart and save me and give me everlasting life. And that's what happened to this man here. Wanting to kill people, wanting to put men and <clears throat> women in prison. But there was a light from heaven. There was a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting there, thou me? Orders were given to where he could go. And this man gave him the plan of salvation. And he was completely changed. And of course he was hated. He was persecuted. And all of that. And ended up giving his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. When there's a salvation comes to a person, there's a change. A wonderful, wonderful change. Now verse 4, though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, be very careful about having confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law, a Pharisee, considering zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead not as though I had already attained Either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I have apprehended that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Just those 14 verses say a lot, don't they? Just those 14 verses. This tremendous change that come into the life of this man. And then God used him to bring changes into the life of hundreds and maybe thousands. How many times do you think an unsaved man or a woman has heard Paul preached his epistles preached and they were convicted and they became born again. I don't know whether something like this might happen, but let's just say that it does. The saints are called in. We're raptured and uh, all the seven years tribulation is over. We go into the millennium and then we go into the everlasting state. And it might be, just, but let's just suppose it is, all right? All of, the, all of this is gone. We're in heaven. We're safe with the Lord. And the men and women who were faithful in leading people to Christ, the Lord allows them to come where this man or woman is standing. And there they are, can fellowship together. I wonder how many men and women would be standing around the Apostle Paul. A lot of folk, amen? Amen. So now I ask myself this question and I ask you this question. How many would I have standing by me? And when that time comes, how many would be standing by you? And can you imagine the tears, the hugs, the thrill of being together and knowing you're going to be in the presence of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Now, last week we pointed out that Paul is talking in verses 1 through 6 about the purity of the believer. 
Obviously, God wants you and I to live a pure life. Obviously. But let me say this. I will never live a pure life until I get serious about it. The Christian life is something to take seriously. Amen? Now, we have a lot of fun here. And that we should. Christians should have more fun, more joy, more happiness than anybody. Do you believe that? I do. But can you imagine what it will be like there? On that place? In that place? And then in verses 7 through 10, we're going to look at the perspective of believers. And we'll go on until we finish. But here in verses 1 through 6, Paul is practically talking about the purity of believers. God wants you and I to live a pure life. Now, let me say this, and you know this. If I have asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and he saved me, that's a done deal. That's forever. That is forever. Uh, you know, we might not like to use the word once saved, always saved. Somebody said, well, you shouldn't say that. But true, that's true. Once you're born again, you're passed from death unto life. Uh, somebody said, well, you know, the world can't take you out of God's hands, but the devil can. No, he can't. Once you're safe in the arms of Jesus, you're safe forever. Amen? And, uh, of course, this is a Wednesday night, and uh, we, we, we anticipate that everyone here is born again, but if you're not, get it settled. Get it settled. And so the Lord wants you and I to live a life of purity. And so he's exhorting this church at Philippi, and he's exhorting these men and women that he's writing to to go after a life of purity purity what will a life of purity do for us it'll save us a lot of heartache it'll save us a lot of sorrow in all of these years of being a pastor I've seen God do some amazing thing in the lives of men and women that were couples I've watched them get to the point where they didn't want to live with each other and they had fights and all of that kind of thing. And they separated and went their ways. But we were able to get them back in church. And they started serving the Lord again. And they reached out for that purity that he's talking about here. And so the Lord's wanting you and I to live a life of purity. And so Paul is conducting himself and he's speaking to them in such a way that they'll understand that they need to come to a place of living purity. That is a sanctified life, a set-apart life. That's where the Lord wants you to be. That's where he wants me to be. He wants us to be set apart, set apart from the world. This old world can bring you down. Now, wait a minute. We want to take the gospel to the world, but that we don't want the world to bring the world to end us. Amen? And so that's why Paul is so particular here in his writings. He wants them to be aware of the evildoers that are out there. And so he says, beware of the concision. These people were evil. These people were bent on and set on ruining the lives of others. And I've watched that down through the years. But we need to set before those that we come in contact with every day, we need to set before them always salvation. Always salvation. Now let me say this. I think one of the greatest testimonies to an unsaved man or an unsaved woman is a separated life. I was going to show Jesse a picture of my first pastor, second pastor, Dr. Arthur Estes. Brother Jan Francis was my first pastor. I was saved under his ministry. But Brother Arthur Estes was my second pastor, and he was the one that put his arms around me and said, Bobby, you're going to be a pastor just like Brother Estes. I never will forget the first time Brother Estes told this story. He said, I'd gotten saved, and he said, I was called to preach, and he said, I had my first little country church. And uh, he said, I uh, had given up drinking, I'd given up cursing. Uh, I got married and said I had my first daughter. And he said I wanted to be as just as godly as I could. But he said one thing I couldn't give up was smoking. And he said one day he was out visiting. And uh, he said he had gone into this group of men. 
and was going to witness to them, but he was going to have a smoke first. And so he walked over to one of the men and started witnessing to him. And so he had his cigarette in his hand. He was witnessing to this man. And the man listened to him. And he said, uh, you're a preacher, right? And Brother Esther said, yes, sir. He said, well, Pastor, why have you got that cigarette in your hand? And Brother Esther said his heart was just, just like that. He was just pricked to the heart. He threw that cigarette on the ground, smashed it out, got on his knees, and he said, Lord, if you'll help me, I'll never pick up one again. And he didn't. Now, that's just a little bit of an illustration of what God wants us to do when we deal with the flesh. We've got to deal with this flesh radically. You can't play games with this flesh. Listen, you can't play games with that world out there. That world out there wants to do everything it can to bring you down as a believer. And so he's telling us here how important it is to live a sanctified, sanctified life, a, a pure life, so that we'll be able to reach the world with the gospel. Now notice verse 1 and verse 2 again. Look at it if you will. And notice the purity of their steps. That is the purity of the steps of these men that Paul is preaching to here. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me it is indeed, it's not grievous, but for you it is safe. And I want you to beware of evil workers and beware of the concision. Why? Because he does not want them to be brought down. So he's saying, I want you to be careful. I want you to think again and again and again how important your steps are. You need to walk a pure life. Do you find that hard sometimes? You're not perfect and I'm not perfect. All these years of being a pastor, but I'm not perfect. I have my battles with the devil just like you do. There are things that, that I would like to enjoy, but I can't do it because it, it's not right. It's a sin. But you know what? Eventually we're going to fall. Eventually we're going to mess up because we're human beings. Amen? Well, aren't you glad that God doesn't throw you away when you mess up? Aren't you glad? He was not going to throw you away. He loves you. You're his child. But he does want you to be as pure as you, and live as a pure life as you can. Why? To touch the lives of other people. Can you imagine the power of a separated life? Now when I talk about a separated life, I'm not talking about legalism. legalism. We have a lot of folk that are legalists. But sometimes they're, they're, they're casting a darker spell than the person that's away from the Lord for a period of time. And so Paul says, I, I want you to have this purity. And he says, I want you to rejoice. Don't you love to rejoice? Don't you love to be happy? Don't you enjoy it when you come to church and God's just speaking to our heart? And he's using you and you're seeing a change in the lives of people. That's what we want in our church. Now I hope you're praying for people in our church. Sunday morning I want you to pray for the service and I want you to pray for the sermon I'm going to bring Satan is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour he'll be after you this week he'll be after me this week and so we want to, to, to rejoice the Lord wants us to rejoice and have gladness because we're getting victory we're being used of him and we're to be glad in the Lord now watch Paul went through some of the most difficult circumstances that a man could go through. Read his life, the prison, and all of the rest of it, and yet he still lived a pure, a pure life. And God used him to touch the lives of many. So they were rejoicing. But secondly, they had a reputation. They had a reputation for being godly men and women. I pray, now, now let me say this, when I introduce myself or somebody introduces themselves to me and, and they know who I am, they'll say, oh, you're at that church down, yes, that's that church there. And what I like to hear is, 
I hear that's a good church. That's good people down there. They love one another. They love the Lord. And they don't even name some names of people that have a great testimony. We must have that in these latter days. By the way, we are living in the latter days. You know that, don't you? We're living in the latter days. And things are going to get more and more difficult. Vileness and evilness is going to continue to advance. And Satan's going to use everything he can to keep you and I from rejoicing. And he wants us to just have a reputation in front of the, of the world that we're godly men and women. All right, we'll stop right there because I want to have a meeting with our folk. Uh, we want to get together and uh, the, fr the funeral will be on uh, this coming Friday. And uh, brother, if you would just tell us, uh, tell the whole congregation so they'll know what uh, you've decided on uh, for the, the beginning of the, when we come in. Now, what time do you want to start act the actual service? When for the music and then the preaching? Two o'clock. All right, two o'clock. All right, brother Jesse, you think you can make that? I don't know. All right, let's do this. Let let's do this. If you can, we'll let you use this. You can do the singing and uh, so forth because it would be much better if you do it. <laughs> oh, you do. All right. Well, that that is fantastic then. And you just don't know how much that's going to save you for you don't have to listen to me lead saying it. <laughs> okay. That, uh, if he can, we'll work that out, Jesse. If you can't, that's okay too, okay? All right, so about one or two songs and then the message, and then we'll dismiss and so forth, okay? Yes, All right, and uh, do you, you want our organist to play? Uh, please. All right, where is she sitting? She hide, she's hiding in the back back there.